Early risers! Wow! So glad you got up early to worship with us this morning. If you happen to be here for the very first time, if you're a guest, we hope you feel really welcome. My name is Brian Anderson. I'm one of the pastors here at the church, and probably the most important thing that I want to say this morning is Happy Mother's Day to all you moms out there. So glad you're here. I hope you get a free family photo while you're here. You know, in honor of moms, we've uh, put together a short little video that we want to show you. So let's go ahead and run that video right now. We are moms who are pouring ourselves into our children every hour of every day. We are grandmothers who are also playing the role of primary caretaker. We are moms who are waiting to have children and trying our best to see the struggle through the eyes of God. We are moms who are learning the challenges of a blended family. We are moms in the workplace who are trying our best to balance competing expectations and demands. We are moms with adult children who are leaving our homes to pursue their own dreams. For packing lunches late at night, for cleaning out their backpacks, then filling them again, for offering gentle guidance to your own grown children, for becoming taxi drivers and appointment schedulers, for making sure the right baby doll is in their arms before they go to sleep, for helping them pay back their student loans, for cleaning and sterilizing and cooking, for doing their laundry and his laundry and our laundry, for praying and loving and forgiving, and falling down and rising to your feet again. For the mom who is overworked and exhausted. For the mom who seems to spend a million hours on a million little things. For the mom who pours Jesus into her family as best she can. And God himself not only celebrates what you do, but rejoices over the uniqueness of who you are. You are seen and you are loved without limits. That is so true, moms. You are loved without limits. You are loved without limits. Hey, uh, this is Eddie Hyatt, and I've asked Eddie, I've asked Eddie in honor of Mother's Day. He's one of the dads in our church. We want to pray a special blessing over all the moms. Eddie's been a leader here at the Vineyard for a number of years. And also, we've just hired Eddie to be our newest pastor on staff. So he'll be starting uh, in a few months, about the beginning of August or so. So could all the moms please stand right now? Like I said, I've asked Eddie to pray a blessing over you. If you're seated around a mom, would you mind just maybe placing your hand on them or pointing your hand toward them and agree with Eddie in prayer as we bless our moms this morning, okay? Let's pray. Or I'll give it over to Eddie first, sorry. Well, Father, we, we welcome your presence here today. We thank you for every woman that is on their feet right now. Father, even as they're on their feet, we pray that you would give them rest, that you would give them joy, and that you would give them your peace that only you can bring. Father, may these moms know that they matter, that they're seen, and that the work that they do is important, and that because of them, spiritual lives are being changed in this church, in their homes, in their communities, Amen. Father, their workplaces. So Holy Spirit, come and empower them with whatever plan you have for them. May these women, may these mothers break through with your kingdom just being brought forth. Jesus, we pray that they would continue to make much of you and all that they do. So as a church, we bless them, we honor them, and we lift them up to you, Lord. And we pray this all in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Hey, if you have a Bible, uh, where I'm going to be teaching out of the Bible this morning is in John chapter 6. We're going to look at the first 13 vo uh, verses, so if you have an app or the actual Bible, John 6, verses 1 to 13. Before we dive into that, we're going to receive our offering, and so if the ushers want to please come forward. And I want to just take a moment and thank those of you that give 
financially to God through the vineyard and remind you that when you do that, it really does make a big difference in lots and lots of lives. You know, we're able to uh, uh, really connect people with God through our giving. We're able to feed and clothe lots and lots of people. It really does matter. I just want you to know that. And I know so many of you are incredibly faithful and generous in your giving. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. May the Lord bless you whenever you give. So we're going to pray, ask God's blessing on the offering. Let's open our hearts to God, though, and let's ask God to speak to us this morning out of the Bible, okay? Lord, thank you that we get to partner with you in what you're doing in the world, what you're doing through our church, and one of the ways that we get to do that, God, is through giving back to you a portion of our finances. And Lord, as we do that, we pray that not only would our finances lift up and glorify the name of Jesus, but you would use them in tangible ways to help change people's lives. Bless our gifts as we give them, Lord. Bless us in our faithfulness in giving back to you. And now, Lord, as we look into the scriptures, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak to each one of us. And I know for that to happen, God, that I need your empowering. And so I pray for that right now, that, that you, Holy Spirit, would empower me. You would give me the gift of teaching. You would help me to teach the things that you want me to teach. And God, if there are things that I've not thought about or or study for this message, and yet there are things that you want me to communicate, then I pray that you would drop those in my mind and heart as we go along, because we truly want to hear from you. So come and have your way, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've been doing a series called Life-Changing Words for the last several weeks, and in this series, we're looking at certain words that if we apply them to our life, they will actually change our life. We looked at the word wow, we looked at the word no, we looked at the word yes last weekend. This weekend, sort of in, in uh, honor of moms, because this is a good thing to say to our moms, we're going to look at the words thank you. The words thank you. And thank you or thanks is actually a theme that, that appears all through the Bible. And I'm sure most of you would agree that the word thanks is a good word to say, right? It's a good word for us to live by. In fact, those of you that are parents, probably one of the first words that you taught your children were the word thank you. The words thank you were the word thanks. You know, thank you is polite, isn't it? Thank you is proper. And in the book of First Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul writes to a community of relatively new followers of Jesus. These people are just sort of learning how to follow Jesus. And Paul offers them some mind-blowing thoughts about what life with God really looks like. He says in chapter 5, verses 16 to 18, he tells them, rejoice always. Mind-blowing, right? Pray without ceasing. Mind-blowing. In everything, give thanks. Again, mind-blowing. And then he says, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Underline the word will. Because the word will there in the original language in Greek, it means God's best offer to people, which can be accepted or rejected. See, what Paul's telling these followers of Jesus is there are two ways you can live your life. There's the way of thanks, and that's God's will. You know, that's God's best for you. That's the life that God created you to live. Or you can live with ingratitude. But if you live that way, that will lead you away from God. In other words, what Paul is really telling these people is you need to say thanks. Why? Because it will change your life if you do. It will change your life. It really will. Now, when you look at the life of Jesus, you know, the word thanks was something that Jesus said quite often. And yet, I think if we're honest, you know, as Americans, the only times that we really say a heartfelt thanks is when somebody does something for us that's really a blessing, or maybe our circumstances turn out in such a way that it's just a real blessing to us. But if you look at the life of Jesus, 
you'll find that he said thanks at some very, very unlikely times. For example, the night before Jesus was crucified, knowing that he's going to have to endure great pain, knowing that he's going to have to deal with an incredibly painful, torturous death in just a few hours, we read that Jesus takes the bread, like we did a short time ago, and the first thing he does is he gives thanks to God the Father for the bread. And then he breaks it, and he gives it to his disciples. I mean, the night before his death, Jesus was giving thanks. Another time, a really close friend of Jesus, his name is Lazarus, he had just died. And we're told that he'd been in the, in the grave, he'd been dead for four days. And Jesus is so upset by this news that the Bible says that he weeps about it. But then he does something that you might not expect. He prays, which we might expect, but the first words out of his mouth in his prayer are these, Father, I thank you, I thank you that you have heard me. I'm in the wake, in the wake of a very painful loss, we see Jesus giving thanks. Some of you might know the name Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer was a German pastor and a theologian who lived during the World War II era. And Bonhoeffer strongly opposed the atrocities that were being committed by the Nazis against the Jews. And in 1943, Bonhoeffer was arrested because of his opposition to Hitler and his opposition to what the Germans were doing to the Jews. He ended up spending a year and a half in prison before being transferred to a concentration camp. And he was executed in that concentration camp a short time earlier. But Bonhoeffer did some of his most profound writing while he was in prison. And one such reflection included this line that I love. He says this, It's only with gratitude that life becomes rich. It's only with gratitude that life becomes rich. Would you say that out loud? It's only with gratitude that life becomes rich. That is so true. And that was an incredible statement for Bonhoeffer to make if you consider the world that he was living in at that time. I mean, he's living in isolation. He's living in, in, in uncertainty. He's grieving deeply over the state of the world and what's happening around him. And yet, he still gives thanks. Let me ask you, are you someone who gives thanks? Are you someone who really tries to live a grateful life? You know, remember Paul says, in everything, give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, I want to point out, he does not say for everything, give thanks. There are a lot of things that happen in this world that are not God's will. You know, there is another team playing on the, on the field. It's not just God's team, there's another team. It's called the devil and his minions and they love to steal and kill and destroy. And so not everything that happens in this world by any means is God's will. So we don't thank God in ev- I mean, for everything, but we can thank him in everything. Are you someone who tries to thank God in everything? If you're a follower of Jesus, that's one of the things that God wants us to, to really do and really work on. In everything, give thanks. You know, it's Mother's Day. How about you moms? You know, when your kids completely, or your husband if you're married, they completely forget about Mother's Day. Do you give thanks in everything? That's kind of hard to do at times, isn't it? You know, maybe you're driving down the freeway and somebody cuts you off. It's their fault. Maybe you give them a horn honk, you know, or something. And then they tell you that you're number one. You know, are you giving... (laughs) thanks in everything. Or maybe, maybe your dog ends up peeing on your pillow. I give you that example because that actually happened. Our dog, our little sweet dog, Candy, she's sort of a spiteful little dog though, because when you don't give her enough attention, she gets attention. And so evidently she thought my wife, because it was her pillow, she thought my wife wasn't giving her enough attention. And so she went up and peed on my wife's pillow. She had no idea. My wife goes to bed and there's pee 
all over her pillow. I said, honey, are you going to give thanks in everything? She said, what am I going to be thankful about this? And I said, well, at least it wasn't poop. No, I'm kidding. I didn't say that. <laughs> in everything, we're to give thanks. Now, for Jesus, the word thanks was not just a proper word. It wasn't something that Jesus said out of obligation. No, Jesus saying thanks was a reality-shaping, life-enriching word that bound him together with God the Father in such a way that no matter what his circumstances were, he could say, this is a rich life. This is a rich life. God, thank you. And interestingly, that's the same word that Bonhoeffer used. It's only with gratitude that life becomes rich. And I think what God is trying to tell us is that the level of richness in our life is directly linked to the frequency and the sincerity with which we learn to say thank you. And the good news is, the good news is all of us can learn to say thank you much more often than we currently are. So that's the question. How do we do that? How do we really learn deep down to be a thankful person? I had to turn to John 6. We're going to look at a story that many of you know uh, about the disciples of Jesus and what Jesus did. Beginning in verse 1. After this, Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. A huge crowd kept following Jesus everywhere, wherever he went because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. Then Jesus climbed a hill and sat down with his disciples around him. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. Jesus soon saw a, lo- a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? Now, why do you think that Jesus asked Philip where they could buy bread instead of asking one of the one of the other disciples. Do you think it was just happenstance? I don't think it was. Because we know from Luke's account of this story that Philip was from a city called Bethsaida. And we also know that they were actually in Bethsaida when this was happening. Bethsaida's Philip's hometown. And so Philip knows the territory, right? And so Jesus asked Philip this question, where can we buy food buy bread to feed all these people because Philip knows the territory. He knows where the closest in and out is. He knows where Payway, knows where Cheesecake Factory, whatever it is. And so how does Philip respond to this? Verse 6, he was testing Philip for he already knew what he was going to do. Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed all these people. Now, I want you to notice that Philip's thoughts go immediately toward what they don't have, what they lack. They don't have the money to feed all these people. And it makes total sense that Philip was thinking this way because Philip was living in a world where 70% of the people were hovering around the extreme poverty level. Extreme poverty. That means that 70% of the people barely had their basic needs for life met. See, scarcity was not a foreign idea to these guys. They knew what it was like. They lived it every single day. See, in the Roman culture that they were living in, the poor, who were by far the majority, they had to rely on the wealthy for survival. And then they were expected to express gratitude to the wealthy for doing this. But really, it was just one of the ways that the Romans could make sure they they were able to keep the poor in their place. It was one of the ways the Romans maintained social order. But this cultural norm perpetuated certain ways of seeing the world. You know, the wealthy, they thought that they were entitled to what they have. They thought that they weren't indebted to anyone. And that's really 
Something that I think a lot of wealthy people can easily fall into. And by the way, we as Americans, we're in the top 95% of the wealthiest people in the world. If you're buying a house, you may not picture yourself as wealthy, but when you compare to the rest of the world, you're in the top 3% of the wealthiest people in the world. And one of the things that's easy to fall into is feel like we, we deserve this. We're not indebted to anyone. You know, we're not as grateful as probably should be. We're entitled. But the poor, you know, they lived in that culture. They lived with this sense of indebtedness and indebted to the wealthy. And so that's the world that Philip lives in. I mean, you don't buy bread for thousands and thousands of people when you don't even have enough money to buy bread for yourself and for your family. And you don't borrow that kind of money either because then you'd be in debt for the rest of your life. So Philip is just giving Jesus the normal answer that everybody would, would expect. This ain't going to happen. We don't have enough money. And yet, and yet, Andrew, another one of the disciples of Jesus, he's standing right there, and he has a different read on the situation. Same circumstance, but Andrew sees something different. Look at it says in verse 8. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? See, I want you to notice the difference in the experience of these two disciples. Philip sees only want. Andrew begins to see wonder. Andrew begins to see possibility. But the truth is, most of us, most of us, we almost always default to want, to what we don't have, instead of trying to embrace wonder, trying to embrace possibility. And this want can take on all kinds of forms. You know, for Adam and Eve, it took on the form of wanting the fruit from the one tree in the entire Garden of Eden that God said they could not eat from. Instead of basking in the wonder of all the other stuff that God had provided in the Garden of Eden. Now for some of us, I think want takes on the form of continually comparing ourselves with other people. You know, comparing what we have with what others have, and that produces want inside of us because the truth is you always find some, somebody who has more than you. In whatever area you're going to compare, somebody always has more. They have more money. They're better looking, except for, you know, me. But <laughs> for those of you that are new, I'm joking, okay? Uh, they have a better house. They have a nicer car. They're, you know, more in shape, whatever you're comparing. We always find people that are better. Comparison, it always leads to want. It's a terrible habit that all of us need to break. Comparison always leads to want. Say that out loud. Comparison always leads to want. Now turn to your neighbor and say, so don't do that. Don't do that, all right? Don't compare. It leads to want. Now, I also want you to notice that the Apostle John, when he's writing this, he includes some very specific details about the nature of the bread and the nature of the fish in this little boy's lunch. First thing he says is that the loaves of, of bread in this kid's lunch are made out of barley. And then it doesn't say in John's gospel, but one of the other gospels, it says that these fish are very small. And those details are actually significant to us as the reader. See, in that day, the cheapest of all breads was barley bread. See, barley was a poor man's bread. And John put that detail in to make sure that we understood this lunch was from a poor kid. And then there's the detail about these two fish being very small. 
So I want you to picture for a moment an Alaskan king salmon caught by an incredible fisherman. <laughs> I grew up in the state of Washington, and so every summer that was part of our vacation. We'd go to the Pacific Ocean, we had a boat, and, and we would go salmon fishing, caught lots and lots of salmon, and uh, a, a lot of fun. But, uh, you know, now take that picture of that king salmon out of your mind and think about the exact opposite. Because that's what that little boy had. He had two little sardine-like fish about that size. And they'd probably been pickled for the sake of preservation. And the boy probably had these fish in his lunch in order to help him swallow the dry barley bread. And so the point that John is making is this is an ordinary meal. It was not a feast. It was a poor man's lunch. And even though that's true, Andrew stops to notice it. He notices. Andrew wonders about it. See, if we want to end up being grateful people, if we want to live out God's best for us, it requires that we pay attention to the wonder that's all around us. We need to pay attention to the extraordinary that's all around us, but we also need to pay attention to the ordinary all around us. And as we see, even the ordinary, we need to learn to give thanks in those ordinary moments. You know, I have a friend. His name's David Parker. He was the senior pastor of the Desert Vineyard Church in Lancaster, California for many, many years until just recently. And a few years ago, David was diagnosed with a very aggressive form of cancer. It's called angiosarcoma. And it has metastasized in his body in several places. And David has fought this cancer bravely over the last several years. But his comments on Twitter, they've just been incredible to me. I want to read a few of his tweets. So yesterday... We learned that my latest PET scan shows the spread of cancer to a small area in my chest. Meeting tomorrow with my UCLA oncol oncologists to talk about what's next. Grateful. See that word? Grateful for this time I've had free of treatment and profoundly thankful for all the love and prayers. Here's another one. So I sit here giving, getting chemotherapy this morning thinking about all the blessings in my life. This picture is from an afternoon I spent with John Wooden years ago talking about basketball, faith, and marriage. Our lives are a gift and the people in them a treasure. Hashtag, oh that hair. <laughs> I'll read you another. Nancy, that's his wife, and I moved close enough to my doctor's offices in Santa Monica near Mandy, Matt, and Wren that I thought I could walk there every day if I had to. Now I'm too weak to do that. I give thanks for living in the land of $5 Uber rides. <laughs> Look at his hashtags. Profound. Find gratitude. Hashtag choose joy. Did you know that joy is a choice? Finding gratitude is a choice. Let me read one more. This week's pause from treatment has stemmed my weight loss free fall and given me strength to begin again tomorrow. So grateful for all the kind words and earnest prayers sent my way. Grateful to have such faithful friends. You know, David has been on the top of my prayer list for a number of years now, like a few of you that have cancer in our church family are. But I want to point out his tweets to you because our ability to be grateful people really is dependent on our ability to, you know, look with our eyes and see possibility around us, no matter what our circumstances are, in everything, we're to give thanks. That's what David Parker's doing. See, God wants us to be people who live constantly in the presence of even the smallest wonders. Because when we lose wonder as human beings, what happens is our world becomes reduced, like Phillips, to what we can do for ourselves. 
And that's when we don't have any gratitude anymore. And so as you will go about your daily activities this coming week, try to take note of what your own default mode is. You know, at any given moment, are you more prone to want? Think about what you don't have. Or are you more prone to wonder? Think about what God has given you. I mean, do you find yourself perpetually frustrated by what's missing in your life? Or are you trying to take the time to be thankful to what God has given you in your life? Now, to become a little bit more like Andrew and a little bit less like Philip, I think one of the things that most of us need to do is we need to slow down the pace of our life and start consciously looking for things around us that will produce gratitude in us. In fact, at the end of the day, every day, we might even ask ourselves this question, what did I see today that caused me to experience gratitude and wonder? See, that's what David Parker is doing. You can tell. You can tell. But this story that we're reading, it doesn't just end with wonder. Look what happens next in verse 10. Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered 5,000. Now most scholars believe there was probably somewhere between fifteen and 20,000 people there that day. 5,000 men, when you include all the children, all the women, all that... Uh, somewhere between 15 and 20,000 people. If you have a hard time picturing how many people that is, that's like how many people would go to a Phoenix Suns game back when they used to win. Okay? 15 or 20. I know it's been a long time, hard for us to remember, but 15 or 20,000, that's it. Then Jesus, verse 11, Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God. That's the first thing he does, underline that and distributed them to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted. After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. So the first thing Jesus does is he takes these five loaves and these two fish and he offers them up to God and he gives thanks to God for them. Now, I don't know about you, but if that were me, I think I would have waited to give thanks until I'd started passing them out and see what's going to happen because I wouldn't want to be embarrassed. But that's not the way Jesus does it. And again, this is another one of those unconventional giving of thanks by Jesus. He gives thanks to the Father first, and then he breaks out the bread and the fish, and he starts passing them around. Now imagine if you were in that crowd, and imagine if you were sort of toward the back, and you see this commotion that's kind of going on up front, and you see that it looks like some food is being pushed around, you know, being given out, and you're like, man, that's amazing. Would there ever be enough for me? Do you think that little bit would last all the way back here to me? And then miraculously it does. The bread and the fish never run out. In fact, the more people eat, the more there seems to be. See, in this miracle, God was proving once again that there's no giver like God. There's no giver like God. There is no end to what God gives. No end. In fact, God's giving can never be outdone by any kind of human need. I don't care what your human need is right now, God's giving can never be outdone. And that's why Jesus says thanks right at the beginning, because he already knew this. He already knew that God's giving can never be outdone. And then it says that they picked up 12 basketfuls of leftovers. John is very specific. There's 12. There's not 11. There's not 13. There's 12. And I think that's really significant. I think there's meaning behind that. You say, well, why, Brian? Why 12? Well, see, in the the Bible, the number 12, or multiples of 12, 
always refers to the people of God. It starts out with the 12 sons of Jacob. And then it's the 12 tribes of Israel, the people of God in the Old Testament. And then it's the 12 disciples in the New Testament. In the book of Revelation, it talks about 144,000 representing the people of God. Not an exact number, not a real number, but representing, symbolic of the people of God. I think God was making sure that everybody understood, I will always take care of my people, God was saying. I will always take care of my people. Maybe you need to hear that today. God will take care of you. No matter what's going on in your life, God will take care of you. And I think another reason why there were 12 baskets left over is so that every single disciple could take one of those baskets and take it home as a reminder to himself and to others of this incredible miracle that God, God did and what kind of God God really is. Christian author Virginia Owens, she says this about gratitude. Thanksgiving is not the result of perception. Thanksgiving is the access to perception. In other words, Thanksgiving is not merely a way of living out positive thinking. You know, you don't give thanks and that's, you know, one of the ways you try to see the glass half full or all that. No, Thanksgiving helps us learn to live with an entirely different paradigm because we're living in an entirely different kingdom. See, the kingdom of God is a kingdom of plenty. It's a kingdom of, of abundance. It's a kingdom where giving never runs out. And on that day, on that hillside, Jesus used the bread and the fish to make a profound statement about what his kingdom really looks like and about the kind of king that he really is. And the more that you and I learn to live with the word thanks, the better we come to know God's kingdom and the better we come to know Jesus as the king. Now at the end of John chapter 6, Jesus makes an incredible statement of verse 51. He says this, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. Anyone, anyone. And this bread which I'll offer so the world may live is my flesh. Now, I don't know what the circumstances are in your life right now. I hope, as your pastor, I hope, I hope that everything in your life is up and to the right. I hope that you're healthy, I hope that your finances are great. I hope that every relationship in your life is perfect. I hope that's the case. But I know there's a whole bunch of you here that your circumstances are the complete opposite of that. You know, when your circumstances are great, it's really not that difficult to find gratitude to God, is it? But it's when your circumstances aren't great that's the real test. Am I going to be somebody who really gives thanks to God in everything? Even in this? You know, maybe you're filled with a lot of pain right now. Emotional pain, physical pain. Maybe a loved one or maybe you yourself, you've been diagnosed with a very deadly disease. Maybe you're filled with fear. Maybe you're filled with worry about yourself, one of your children, something like that. See, when we find ourselves in difficult circumstances like that, then it's really hard. It's hard to say thanks. But Paul says, I want you to learn to say thanks in everything. Not for everything, but in everything. And for us to be able to do that, it depends on our ability to wonder, to look for possibility. But at the end of the day, our ongoing thanks demands that we cling to this truth that we just read in verse 51, let's read it again, where Jesus says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. He is. And anyone, anyone, anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And this bread, which I will offer so the world may live, is my flesh. Now obviously Jesus is talking about his own death here. He's speaking about the great pain 
that he's going to go through. See, Jesus doesn't just give us bread, does he? Jesus gives us himself. And knowing where this story goes, that's one of the things that enables us to embrace both the small and the large wonders of our world. And yet, and yet, you're not living in unreality. At the same time, even though you embrace the wonders, you're still able to embrace the pain. And you're still able to say thanks. So where are you at in this area of gratitude? Do you always default to want what you don't have? Or are you trying to embrace wonder and be grateful to God even in everything? Would you pray with me? You know, just as we're in an attitude of prayer, I mean, I'm, I'm going to pray in just a moment, but, you know, I think that there are some of you here that have some really dire circumstances. Unfortunately, I'm so sorry. That's one of the things that happens in life, isn't it? And one of the best things that we can do when we have some dire circumstances is we need some brothers and sisters in Christ to lay their hands on us and pray for us. And so I know it's Mother's Day and you may have a million things going on, but man, if your circumstances need changing, I really want to encourage you to stick around afterwards. We'll have a ministry team up here at the front. We'd love to pray for you. We'd love to hear what's going on in your life. Come alongside you, lay our hands on you, and ask God to intervene. You know, at any moment, at any moment, God can change the circumstance. He can bring healing. He can bring deliverance. He can bring whatever you need. So I would encourage you to receive some prayer today if your circumstances aren't what you want them to be. But Lord, I, I pray for all my friends here that you would help us, God, not continually default to want what we don't have. Help us begin to default to wonder and seeing the possibility and seeing your hand even in circumstances that are difficult. Help us to be men and women who are able to, in everything, give thanks because it's God's will. Make us a grateful people, Lord. Maybe there's something in your life right now that you need to do a little spiritual business with God right now before you leave, just these last moments. You know, maybe it's about the comparison thing. Maybe you're one who's continually comparing. I'm telling you, you'll never be a grateful person. God, help me. Would you break the power of comparison over me? and continually doing that. You know, if you're a guest here this morning and you've never gone to a guest welcome, maybe you've been coming for a few weeks, maybe this is your first time, We'd love for you to stop by our information center out in the lobby. We'd love to give you some information to take with you. It takes just a couple of minutes, and then you can uh, find out some things that are going on here at the vineyard, maybe answer some questions. Before we go, I want to pray a blessing over us. So if you could stand, and I'd like the ministry team to please come forward. Lord, thank you for all my friends here. And as they go today, Lord, would you bless them in a real special way. Bless them, keep them, cause your face to shine upon them, be gracious to them. Lift up your favor to every one of them, God, and give them your peace now as they go. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. Happy Mother's Day, you guys. Free photos out in the lobby out there. You can get a free photo for your family. Hey, God bless you. We'll see you soon.